Hey guys, DJ Sam with us here. Welcome back to another video. In this video, we are talking to Kieran, the co-founder of Alluvium. But before we get stuck into it, make sure you like this video, click subscribe down below and turn that bell notification on and enjoy. All right, we've got Kieran Warwick on here, chat. He is the co-founder of Alluvium. Uh, he had founded it with his brother named Aaron. He is also a co-founder. He actually has another brother on top of that who is uh, basically the co-founder of Synthetics, which I actually invested in a competitor to that, which is Mirror. But Synthetics is a great, great project. I, uh, I highly like it a lot. Um, Kane is basically his brother who is very competitive. Him and, him and Kieran go head to head a lot, I believe, like most brotherly love, uh, especially for Australians. Uh, he's based in Sydney and he's had four to five startups in his life. He is currently the chairman of the Burger Collective. It is a review app for burgers. Uh, I don't know if it's all around the world, but it could be maybe in Australia. He can fix it up for me uh, later on. A bit of past of him is he was in sales, marketing, and directing at Blue Shift, co-founder of Audio Invasion, used to work at Harvey Norman, and he's went to school for education-wise at Barker College. Now, his journey so far, that from what I have found, is in 2016, he uh, was a part of over-the-counter crypto ex Bitcoin exchange. That sort of put his feet in the water, as I like to say, for the crypto space. And uh, he was also investing into stocks slash penny stocks, uh, which drew him further into the crypto space at the time. He's been an avid gamer all of his life, and he's found Alluvium in around 2020. Now, the team about six months ago in January was around 10, and they've scaled to 100 plus. Uh, that was back in April, May, so I don't know how much it is now. He will again clear this up for us, chat. They raised $45 million with a big help slash thanks to Santiago uh, with all the connections there. And they have workers and the team around with around 43 countries again plus. Now, it is a triple A game. He will do more information. How accurate am I there? Am I close? How did I go? You're a triple A podcast, so I'll give you that. <laughs> Anything I stuffed up or missed or is it we're pretty good there? Uh, we're, we're pretty good. We're, we're pretty good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the 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 Burger Collective is uh, is global, but it's still uh, it's quite a, a niche app. But okay, uh, that's the only that's it pretty much. And uh, I'm very competitive with Kane, but you forgot to mention that I usually always win. Oh. Well. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I like the answer. Um, so <laughs> I thought to get stuck into things, what I did is I did a Twitter post the other day, uh, just asking basically the community of what they want to know. Um, so I put those questions together, uh, put it into like some sort of storyline and, uh, some things might be a bit repetitive that you have said before. Um, but I guess that's the reason why we do podcasts. The first thing I thought I'd ask you in the community wants to know is what is Alluvium? Like how much does it cost to get started playing? How would you sum up Alluvium? Um, yeah, I'll give us the breakdown. Okay, so there's two paths that you can take. So it's it's essentially a free to play game or a pay to play. And uh, and, and when we say pay to play, more more so um, pay to win essentially. And what Alluvium is is an open world RPG. It's it's based in we've we've essentially got seven biomes that the player can explore and that's the the pve side of it it's very very similar to pokemon where you're traversing this world you're up against you 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 encounter these uh let's call them monsters in our world they're called alluvials um, and and you would liken them to the the Pokemon, and essentially there's there's a couple of trickier ways that we go about it. But you're utilizing shards that you uh, that you mine from the surface, and when you encounter these alluvials, you're trying to battle them. And when you win the battle, you have the ability to capture them inside your shard. And from there, there's multiple paths that, that you can go down. You can become a collector and essentially just keep on continuing that loop, trying to collect as many alluvials as, as possible. You can become, uh, if, if you're really into the strategy side of the game, there is an auto battler component, which is, uh, which is played in a couple of different arenas. 
where you basically that's the the pvp side of things where you're going up head to head uh, against other people that have that have captured these alluvials and you're also using your human character to to win those battles and so there's there's a lot of elements but essentially it's it's like a, a mashup of pokemon and an auto battler very similar to, to um, dota's auto battler or or league of legends uh team fight tactics great sum up for what i've learned that is probably the best the best answer you're going to hear chat uh, i hope that makes all sense to you guys how did the idea come to life this was in 2020 how did you guys think of all the characters and how'd you how'd you bring it all together yeah so uh von newman and i are uh we we go way 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 back and for those who don't know von newman he's our only anonymous person on the project he's one of the co-founders um i've known him for as i said a, a long time and we're avid pokemon fans we like <laughs> it's it's pretty sickening how um <laughs> how into it we are and i had obviously you know you touched on it in the intro i've been in crypto for, for quite some time now and i love gaming and so obviously when i started seeing these nft games pop up uh, in in early 2020 and a lot of these had started in, in 2019 and, and even going back as far as 18 but they had just started getting traction if you're in if you're really entrenched then you could you could start to see this tiny little bubble emerge and I then start, so I started doing a lot of research into NFT gaming and, and NFT platforms. And I was looking at OpenSea and the different collections and stuff. And I then stumbled upon Axie Infinity, which obviously I know uh, your, your viewers are well aware of, uh, <laughs> of what Axie is. And I was just blown away. I couldn't believe that there was a game where you could actually own the assets and you know i i straight away i jumped in and i was literally i was on the phone to von newman at the time and i said to him i said hey check out this game like it's 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 valued at a ridiculous amount and his background is, has been in cgi and and uh for 20 years and i sent him the, the artwork and i said could we build a game that's similar to this and he was like, yeah, hundred percent. We absolutely could. And so that's, um, that's what got, that's what got us onto the, the idea of, of building an NFT game where, so, so, and he, and he's what is, is, is the reason why you're seeing such high fidelity graphics and, and, and really, really pushing what is, is even available in mainstream right now from a graphics standpoint. But uh, Aaron, who is my brother, he basically, when, when we went to him to get the, the game design background and, and when we started thinking, okay, what is this game actually going to look like? He was like, I don't like Pokemon at all. And so if you want me to help you, then we're going to have to come to some sort of agreement here in terms of what we're actually building. And so that's when we... Uh, we we tacked on the auto battler uh, team fight tactics style of game and it actually i'm i'm really glad we did there was a lot as you can imagine brothers there's a, there's a lot of <laughs> um yes. fighting and back and forth and and you know i think i stormed out of his house a couple of times and said, <laughs> All right. but um you, we we got to this happy medium where Von Newman and I had enough elements of Pokemon and collection and, and an abundance of characters that we decided, and I'm actually quite glad we did because it, it makes the battling elements of, of the game a little bit more complex and definitely adds in a lot more strategy than just typical Pokemon style battling. And so, yeah, that's, that's kind of how it all came together between the three of us. I like it. And who thought of the, how did the name come about? How, who chose the name? That was, that was Aaron as well. Okay. Um, so would he, you say he's the better brother or? <laughs> <laughs> he's definitely the smartest of, okay. of all of us. I would uh, reluctantly have to say, no, I, <laughs> I, I, I joke about that, but uh, yeah. he's, 
he's a, he's a freak of nature when it when it comes to this sort of uh, game design and just all on fitting all of the elements together you know i i guess you would call me the visionary on on the project and, and bob newman is is obviously the bringing the, the art direction but yep. aaron really glues it all together and you know things like naming conventions and stuff like that he's he's brilliant at that as you guys know, chat as as Kieran said before, there is going to be, I guess, seven worlds. I guess, or you could call them whatever the terminology is. Regions. In your... Regions. I guess you could... Yeah. Um, yep. The seven regions that uh, will be in Alluvium. How does the traveling work? There's fees and energy because uh, you are a character. Like I, I put it in terms of World of Warcraft, where you walk around and stuff like that. How does the mm -hmm. energy side of things and the fees and traveling work? Sure. So, essentially. We... We've, in order to stop botting, which is very, very important when you're talking about, you know, the real world value that that is inside crypto games, it's a little bit different when you're talking about the value in a typical mainstream game, which is is usually coming from just purely time. But that's why you you see the the travel fees in Alluvium. And so they're not designed to really like king the player and, and a, a massive revenue generator from, from the Alluvium Vault side of things. It's more to, to stop those bots. And so essentially what it is, is you, you'll go to a obelisk and there's seven that are spread across in, and so one in each region. And you just walk up to the obelisk, pay your fee, and it will shoot you into that region. And then inside that region, that's where you're, you're going around. And you know, you've, you've got, um, if, if you've been able to craft it, you've got your jetpack, you've got your mag boots, and you're essentially uh, just exploring this world and trying to encounter the rarest alluvials that you can possibly find. And to do that, you also need a shard as well. And so you essentially mine shards from the, 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 the world's core. And um, there's a bunch of other things that you can do with mining in terms of like crafting weapons and stuff like that. But the main, the, one of the main uses is, is obviously these shards. Similar to Pokemon in that there's levels of the shards or in, in Pokemon's case, the, the Pokeballs. And so depending on what you come up against, if, if, if you're talking, uh, let's call it like a, a holographic Ramfire, which is an extremely rare character anyway. But then when you add the, the fact that you've come up against a holographic one, you're talking like next level rarity. You definitely want to be holding a tier four or, or, or a five shard even to, to make sure that once you do have, uh, you know, ideally once you, once you battle it and, uh, and defeat it, you have the proper equipment so you can go and catch it. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then with the energy, is there energy involved? Like if we look at Axie Infinity, there's energy you spend per day and then it's pretty much, you can't play after that where well, you can play, but there's no sort of play to earn sort of model there. Is there energy involved at all in this or you just run around versing? No, no. So the, the, the idea is that you can, you can play as much as you want. Obviously we don't encourage you to play 24 hours. <laughs> sure. Don't play driving a car either chat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so no, there's, there's no energy in there. Obviously there is, you, you're somewhat, there is a free to play element in, in the game, which I'll, I'll explain in a second. And you can actually, yeah. you can actually grind hard enough to, to basically level up over time and uh and you won't actually need to to put in any money and you'll have oh. the ability yeah which chat, is chat which will is, love that chat will absolutely love that and like the the biggest issue that that i see with axie right now is the barrier to entry mm. and so you know there's this whole conversation about scholarships and whatever and like even my DMs are, are, are blowing up every single day about people asking for a scholarship. And my response to these people is, you don't need a scholarship. 
Like you genuinely don't need a scholarship. Now, the reason why I'm not against scholarships to a certain degree is because they can facilitate a, a much, much faster growth in our game. If you do have one and you're in a situation where you don't have any capital to get started, but we're not going to set this, the, the, we're not going to set the game up where if you don't have a thousand dollars, you're out, you can't play. Yeah. And we're also not going to set the game up in a way where it's like you've played for five hours today, you're not allowed to play any longer. You know, yeah. the, those sort of barriers to entry and, and, and hurdles are what we're trying to remove because we're going for, we, we want the experience to be as streamlined as a simple game that you would normally play in the mainstream. Like Fortnite or something. You can play at any time. There's no barrier. It doesn't matter what you are, what you do money wise. You still play at a zero money cost entry, but if you want yep. to invest, you can. Correct. Yeah, this is yep. sounding amazing. I think uh, that will excite a lot, a lot of people. Um, sort of limits the barriers, as you said, to uh, to play the game. ILV is the government governance token. You also have a synthetics version, which is called SILV. Um, and then there's Ethereum. So to break it down to the simple terms, uh, if I've got this correct, ILV is your governance token. SILV is basically, from what I understand, is the synthetics version, which you can actually use that for in-game currency, but I think it's only for the fees for traveling. You can clear that up for me now. And then Ethereum is your main currency in the world. Is If you want to give a run rundown on that, that would be amazing. Yeah, that's, that's correct. So essentially, just going through all of those. So mm -hmm. ILV is, is held for a few different reasons. So the main thing that the main thing right now is that the ILV token is the governance token. And so what that means is we're fully decentralized. And so essentially we've our player base or, or our token holders have come together and they've voted. And we literally just had one of these elections take place. But they, they've nominated the, the people that they think are the best fit to run on a council. And then this council decides and, and really shapes the protocol and the game over time. And so holding that ILV token allows you to, to participate in this governance, which is a... a game changer right because it's 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 not like we're a centralized studio that's sitting over here calling all the shots and all of a sudden we just come out and say hey we're going to completely change some of the game's mechanics and you've got a million players that are sitting there going what what the hell is that you know and that's typically what can happen in mainstream and even can happen in in some games that are, are claiming to be decentralized but are not fully decentralized. And so with us, it's literally the community. If, if there's something, if we might as, as core contributors suggest something to the council to say, hey, we, we missed this or we, we've thought of this and we think it's going to improve the, the game somehow. But just because we came up with the idea, it doesn't mean any, that we have any more power than a single you know, contributor or, or community member or investor or whatever. Everyone's on the same level playing field. And it's been amazing to see what that's done for us because it's, it's literally all under the, the, the community and the player's control. And, and so that, that's what ILV, holding the ILV token does. Um, it also has other ancillary benefits, which uh, are more appropriate once the the game goes live but essentially it, it gives you the the option to to stake it which i should say is currently live and so there's a few different uh, pools that you can go into where you can actually stake your rewards you can either not lock them or or decide to lock them for a 12-month period if you do lock them you get additional rewards our single asset staking pool for ILB, I think is giving it around 50, 60% APY, 
which essentially means you know a, a 50 percent gain at the end of the year if everything stays the same so that's pretty cool and um then you've got the revenue distributions right which is the the biggest thing this is this is the thing that i think a lot of investors are waiting for and a lot of and, and when i say investors i mean i mean our uh, our seed investors that when when i was originally pitching that the 100 percent revenue distributions and and just to explain that essentially those in-game transactions that i was talking about where people are paying in an e all of those get uh coupled up and they get uh, put inside a vault and every so often that vault will go and purchase ilv from the market which obviously creates that, that buying pressure and it will then distribute that ilv 100 percent of it so again it's not like there's some massive you know centralized studio that's taking all the profits and you're like what the hell are they doing with it it literally gets distributed 100 percent back to the people that are staked in the protocol wow. which every yeah which every single person who is holding the ilv token there's mm. absolutely no reason why apart from you know the potential of you know something like something um untoward happening to our contracts or whatever there's the, the the way the system is built is you should be staking ilv yeah. if you have it and uh sorry just hit a button there and if you if you are you will get access to these uh revenue distributions once the game goes live okay so basically what you're saying is um, every transaction on the game of Alluvium will then go into this vault and then over X amount of time, whether it's a week or two weeks, uh, that vault will be full of cash money, whatever you want to call it, Ethereum. And then you, you guys will use that randomly and then buy off ILV, the token off the market, which will then obviously create that buy pressure, which whoever is staking ILV, which, which would be the smart thing to do if you have ILV tokens, it will then most likely, if you do the, the, the tokenomics of it, the price should increase and this will happen on a weekly to two weeks or randomly basis um, periodically we, so yeah yeah so that's so insane every, yeah <laughs> that's the, great the, 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 it's it's pretty it's pretty ridiculous and and it's it's a, it's a thing where because it's not real yet until we have the game revenues mm. coming through it's it's something that even i forget about and it's like in the very beginning when when we said that to, to people the, the first thing that people say is well how do you keep running the game like how, how does it all mm. work and um you know we we can get into all of that but but again yeah this is this is literally the first time ever in gaming history where a hundred percent of the profits of the game are being given back to essentially the players which yeah wow who knows what that does <laughs> who knows you're in the unknown territory, so uh, I'm actually excited to see how that plays out over over the months and years to come. So uh, I'm mean, very intrigued to see what happens. SILV is that just for the the fees in the game, or what can SILV be used for? Is it the same as Ethereum, or? Yeah, so so it's essentially pegged to ILV, so yeah. it 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 should be trading at the exact same price, or it it it's shouldn't even be trading to to be honest yep. because what what silv is 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 purely an, an in-game currency there so what we mean by that is when you stake you have the option to receive your rewards in ilv or yep. in silv and if you receive your rewards in silv then they're immediately usable in game and the flip side of that is if you take it in ILV, it's not available to you sure. for 12 months. And so we wanted to give players and, and stakers the, the opportunity to, you know, use it straight away. Yep. What you can't use SILV for, though, is on the exchange. But uh, all in-game purchases and, and wagering as well. So sure. if, you were to battle, if you were to battle someone and... Uh, you wanted to, to put a wager down and, you know, let's say I'm playing Kane. Yeah. You can't use SRV. You would have to put down, say, one ETH in, in that battle.
Okay, so basically it keeps the uh, the economy of the game. It keeps the money in the game, if you think about it, with the staking side of things. Correct. It, it, it 100% does. And, and yeah. what it means as well is every time one of those stakers re uh, decides to, to take that reward in SILV versus ILV, mm. it means that one additional, uh, one extra ILV is taken out of our potentially circulating supply wow and so yeah so not many people know that <laughs> as well so <laughs> if if the game goes if, if, if when the game starts all of a sudden everyone is is taking their rewards in silb then you've got this deflationary <laughs> mechanism that's working in the background so all yeah. of a sudden what was 10 million ILV could potentially be seven and um there's one more thing that we've just one more use case for srv which is probably the most important right now because yeah. it's it's coming up is you can actually purchase land plots using srv right which we're actually going to get stuck into very soon um that the tokenomics of this is phenomenal it's like you've learned across uh, the the years as other projects has come out what works what doesn't and it gives you a bit of uh you know you're standing from the back looking in and then you've like decided to put all these things together so whoever come out with the tokenomics of it from my point of view i highly highly like um and it's very really really smartly done um, it's, wow. um yeah with it's almost like we had access to a guy who'd basically created <laughs> synthetics the staking mechanism yeah that guy, that guy. your brother <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um that's great i yeah again i those tokenomics uh it's going to be very interesting to see how that all plays out because uh it just sounds a lot of upness, but uh, let's see what happens. Obviously, uh, there's you're a character and you have alluvium. So you walk around as a character. Um, I assume the character will level up. Uh, if you could just give us this the slight intro, I believe you crash land on one of the planets. And uh, just the intro so people can understand from like a story point of view what happens at the start and how it all sort of gels in together. It's a little bit of a mystery, so I, I'll but I'll give you the basics, right? Mm. So you're a space-faring colony and you've essentially crash landed on this alien planet you don't know what is going on however there's already this this colony that has has started existing and and like any crazy alien planets when you've got these things that are attacking you what you're trying to do is is, is then defend yourself and then over time you start to go okay do we start capturing these things and then utilizing them. And then there's a whole bunch of uh, different storyline elements that, that I probably can't go into <laughs> or Aaron, Aaron would kill me. Sure, sure. But um, because with us, it, there's your, as you travel around and, and as you go through and, and get to the different regions and, and whatever, you're uncovering the storyline as you go. And so, that was a way for us to 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 bring in a, a really cool in-depth amount of lore and, and and backstory that can be discovered from a single person player view yeah and you know obviously we have plans in the future for for expansions where there's open world like a like a moba but um this was just our way to to keep people you know engaged even though there's not necessarily other players inside the overworld and i believe there's uh there's classes of uh alluvials and also affinities um i i can list off them now because obviously you've probably said this a million times but there's face five base affinities which is water fire earth air and nature and five base classes which is fighter guardian rogue a uh, scion and empath if i've pronounced that correctly um, you, you can yeah. gel it all together. Um, I believe you can have two of stuff. This is where I got a little bit confused at first. Obviously, if you're new to the game, it's a bit overwhelming like anything when you first learn about it. If you could basically do the dumbed down version of that, um, how does that how does that work? Yeah, so essentially what you're looking to do is you're trying to create you have when you, when you're in the battles, you have a certain amount of uh, points, if you will. And so you can only play, you can 
put down three players, five players, even we're potentially talking about being able to put down, uh, when I say players, uh, characters. Yep. And um, and so, but obviously the the higher the tier of character, the of alluvial that you put down, the higher the cost is going to be to you. So there's a little bit of strategy there of, of, of what type of, um, you know, how many high level versus low tier ah, alluvials you wow. put in. Yep, and and essentially what you're trying to, to do is put together, you know, let, let's call it three earth and, and two water. And you what you're trying to do with that is create this additional enhancement that your entire team gets and uh it, it it basically give you gives you bonuses attack bonuses defense bonuses depending on what synergies you're putting together yeah and all different character uh classes and affinities work differently together to to produce you know a, a, a essentially a higher powered team Wow. So this is going to be like, it's like, I look at it like chess. It's this, but more and more strategies. You can go like low level, high level energy. This is going to be so in depth, like putting all that together from like a, a game design point of view would absolutely blow my mind. I'm glad you guys are doing it and not me, but obviously you have to make it work where you will have to gel different uh, alluvials with whether it's high or low levels and make the best strategy work. Uh, not just having, you can't just go buy the best of the best and you're good to go. It's just, it's a lot, lot more to it than that. Yeah, because the other thing as well is you've got a situation where you're in the in the PVE side of things when you're just going around the world and you're you're uh, collecting, you're still using an auto battler, right? So yeah. if you put together your two fighters, all of all of a sudden you're going to get your berserker bonus, right? And so, but where it gets really really tricky is when you're playing the PVP because you're going up against a player who knows what cards you've selected. And so he's going to try and select cards that are, you know, th that are going to be more pow powerful against what you've put down. And so it, there, there are a lot of elements. And this is where I say, I don't even pretend to, <laughs> to, to, to go close to, no to knowing the, the crazy amounts of uh, complexity that he's put in here. But you you talk yeah it's it's <laughs> like auto battlers in general are, are very very complex but I think the the synergy system that that he's built is yeah. is even one step further. Wow, well I'm, I'm hell excited about this game. I'll be very honest. So we know there's PvP, there's PVE. We know that you walk around as a character, you catch alluvials like Pokemon. Um, now there is a drone. I hear there's a drone that you carry with you or it comes with you. Uh, just a, a small breakdown on what the furry little drone does. Yeah, so that's your subordinate drone. The one that everyone has seen and the cute little guy that's in the, <laughs> the video and stuff. Uh, its name is is Mozart. And <laughs> I said, <laughs> which is pretty cool. I think, yeah. I think that was uh, Roger, our uh, our lead concept artist he was the one who came up with that name but that was just that that's your way of mining in the overworld and and doing yeah. a couple of other cool little things but but mainly its job is to scan the 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 environment that you're potentially going to start mining Yes. And then uh, it's its job is to extract the resources, basically. And this isn't on your land. This is in the open world. No, sorry. This is this... in the open world. Just to be clear, there. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Sure. So it's nothing to do with the land. Just if you're walking around, you'll have it with you, and it'll scan the areas, trying to mine things along the way and find things, or whether it's alluvials and so on and so forth. Yes. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Now the alluvial dies. What happens then? Like, do we never get it back? Do we? How do? How does that work? <laughs> No, so they don't die because I, that's a little bit too uh, gruesome. We, <laughs> we, we love our alluvials. But um, they, so essentially they faint and okay. you are required, you can wait a little bit of time. And so I guess this is sort of energy, but you can pay your way out of it. 
And and okay. so essentially your alluvial dies or, or faints. faints rather <laughs> faints. <laughs> and I'm saying now. So it faints and you can take it back to let's call it the alluvial revival center and uh, and you can pay a small fee and revive it or you can simply wait a, a set amount of time and uh, it will uh, get better over time okay, and then so you can I... use it again you you don't you don't ever lose your nft put it that way oh okay so if i'm out in the open world i, I play a couple of games uh obviously one of them faints or whatnot i can just travel back or walk to or whatever it may be uh use yep. islv or ethereum or whatever the currency i have is and then revive it or revive it i guess unfaint it and then uh you're good yep. to go again for another battle exactly or you Absolutely. could wait the time out perfect okay that clears that up uh there is two battle arenas one is ranked one is I, i'll never get this right i'm australian i suck at english is it livithum live leviathan leviathan um and every all the battles are uh are auto battled sorry all every single battle is auto battled uh so if you want to break yes. down the ranked and the whatever the other word is uh that would be great <laughs> <laughs> yep no yeah. worries so yeah. they're essentially so they're essentially one is we probably should have called it the degen arena and not the yeah. leviathan arena but i i probably wouldn't have gotten that one over the line yeah. with aaron but um <laughs> the ranked arena essentially is the normalization of of all the stats and so you you come up against someone with this, with similar standings as you and and skill level and you basically go into this lobby uh you you guys uh, or the the two people come together and you start choosing the alluvials that you want to put down on the board and uh once both both uh, sides have chosen you essentially position the the alluvials where you want them to to be and and that plays a, a massive part of it as well because obviously you want to keep like your your guardians at, at the front and the rogues at the back they like jump across and so there's there's a lot that goes into the positioning but effectively once the game starts it's completely deterministic right and so yeah everything that happens is is automatically happening for you and so all of the strategy that goes into it is uh is done beforehand in in essentially choosing and and uh placing the right characters down to defeat whatever your opponent is is choosing and placing etc yep and so that's that's the normal ranked arena and that's where i would assume that's where we're going to have uh, a lot of our um that's that's the way that our tournaments are going to work and um just battling in in general and and a massive way of of how to actually uh, play to earn in our game and then i the reason i call it the the degen arena is because you essentially there's it's no no holds barred we don't normalize any of the the alluvials so and when i say normalize i mean if you bring in a level 50 ram fire into a, a ranked arena mm -hmm. it will actually get we will uh will will essentially reduce the power of that ram fire based on the the player that you have gotcha. and so it's a, it's completely fair right yeah. so if you both bring in ram fires they're both going to have the exact same level of power and whatever yeah. However, if you do that in the Leviathan arena and I bring in a ram fire and mine's at level one and you bring in a ram fire that's level 50, there's a very high chance that I'm going to get wrecked and I'm going to lose whatever that wager is that, that we put down. Can you wager on both ranked as well or is it only wagering on the no. Leviathan? No, only on the Leviathan. Okay, so ranked is basically you're versing someone uh, same level as you. Everything will be basically even, and the Leviathan is who's got the best. Let's go for it, and you can actually uh, basically put up your Ethereum, or people can gamble or bet on you to see if you beat the opponent. Opponent. So as it stands right now, we don't have the ability for 
there's not going to be like markets created where someone can say, Hey, I'm playing this person and, and we're going to, you know, chuck in money, like, yep. like create that sort of a market. It's purely going to be, I want to battle you. Let's put down a hundred dollars or, or a sure. hundred bucks worth of each. Okay. So it's just the play of E play when it comes to the, the Ethereum side of things. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. And now I hear whispers of the biggest pool, prize pool in history. Now, if, the chat, if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, uh, um, Kieran made a status on Twitter not long ago, uh, and he's this is about the biggest prize pool in a tournament ever. Uh, if you could break that down for us. Now, there is Fortnite and other big games out there, guys like League of Legends, and they have high, high uh, prize pools, and Kieran's here to match it. So I'm intrigued to see what all of this is about. Right, so essentially, we have something that we have a, a, a special weapon that mainstream games don't have in, in crypto. And that's the ability to give in-game yield out in the form of tokens, which if it's a popular game, the token, as you can see by AXS and, and our token and a bunch of other games, those tokens can be very valuable and so we have the ability you know obviously you touched on it in the beginning we raised 45 billion dollars and you know we still have a very 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 large chunk of that and we've got runway for the next three or four years but if we were to go and put say 37 million dollars down and take out the record for any sports tournament we would be screwed because we would have run out of our actual fiat runway. <laughs> but we do have this secret weapon in that we have ILV. And so we, in, inside our tokenomics, we portioned off a million ILV to, to go towards what we're calling it as in-game yield. And part of that is tournaments. And so it's inevitable. And to be completely honest, I will be extremely disappointed if a game that, that launches prior to us doesn't actually do this. I think, and I think, you know, you can, <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> you can read between the lines on who I'm alluding should do this because yeah. they've got a lot of money at the moment, but it's just as much a, a marketing, you know, ploy and, and statement to say, Hey, this is how big we are. But, we can utilize that those million tokens which right now well, after the crash i think it's worth like 450 million <laughs> yeah. but it's 450 million dollars right and yeah you know that's at today's prices we don't even have a game out you know when we get close to, the, to launch we could be think looking at close to one one and a half two billion dollars in in-game yield and so the chance of us not breaking the record is zero like yeah very it, slim I just don't see it <laughs> wow um yeah that's huge i mean it, it pretty much it makes sense to be honest and um it's good to see that you were putting up that sort of uh those tokens up for for tournament based uh gameplay would that be in one tournament would that be over a year over five years what sort of uh for the whole million tokens so to to break that rate i mean that that would be a, a combined uh tournament so that would be a yeah. single tournament to, to break the record but uh, you know that was that was sort of a little bit of a a, a fun tweet and and whatever yeah. as well I, the the exact specifications of what these tournaments would look like i'm not sure but i know that you know i i know what our community's like i know what our council's like and I'm very, very confident that if we were to put on the world's largest esports uh, tournament, I, I think that they would definitely be in favor of that. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Playing on what? So basically, devices. Uh, is it on computer? Is it on iOS, Google Play Store? Is there a roadmap? Uh, we obviously know this is very complicated. You have to work with the app stores as well. Because uh, a lot of people are wondering how do they play this game? Where do they play this game? It's AAA. Uh, what is your roadmap for on and what devices? Yep. So we we actually with literally just before this, I was having a conversation with our 
uh, CTO about what, what we're going to do there. But the plan all along has been to release Alluvium, the, the main game on Mac and PC. And we're looking to do that in Q1 of uh, next year. So, you know, we're getting pretty close now. That is uh, then quickly going to be adapted onto mobile so at some stage next year. I don't have a, a, a set time but we're looking to launch mobile alluvium in uh, in 2022 yep then the land game the which is a mini game which is a little bit interesting that is going to be built on mobile oh and okay so yeah so i can I, I can imagine a lot of the viewers right now are going damn i don't have a laptop or it might not be the right stacks or whatever you still will be able to jump into playing the land game. Again, it's a little bit tricky, as you mentioned, on on how you navigate through the app stores and and get around the fact that you know that there, there are in-game purchases and stuff like yeah. that. And so, it might be a situation where you know we have to work with Apple and and, and figure out what sort of agreement we can come up with. Uh, with both yeah, Apple and, and Google, but we're pretty confident that we'll have both games shipped on mobile by the end of 2022. Perfect. I'm sure chat will be uh, absolutely ecstatic to hear that. Now, that's a perfect segue because literally my next question is about the land mini game. Uh, we've gone through most of the main game, how it all works, the tokenomics and everything. Uh, now, the land mini game, I believe, is coming very, very soon compared to uh, the, the main game, which is in Q1 of 2022. Um, what is the land game? I believe it's coming out in October, November, uh, due to the governance proposal that you guys had. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to give us a breakdown of it, and then I'll go into, the obviously, the 100,000 pieces and whatnot as well. Yeah, so it, it's actually very... So for those who are familiar with uh, Axie Infinity, very similar to them. They had 100,000 land plots. We've decided to, to sell 100,000 land plots as well. They are spread across the seven different regions in uh, in like in Alluvium. They're separate, but essentially the, the from a story perspective, the people that crash land on the main world are different to the the players that go into the mini game alluvium zero and the reason is when they're like crashing to to the planet they they essentially send out research teams and so that's how the two um player bases emerge and so the research team is all about figuring out what, what happened here um and how that sort of ties into it in, in the in the land game is you're basically mining resources from the land and it's your job to on your land plot to actually start building these factories to start harvesting these resources and there's again you know similar to alluvials where there's tier one through or tier zero through through to five there's the the same tiers with land and so the higher the the tier that you purchase the more mineral deposits and 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 stuff that you can actually uh extract and harvest from your land plot which you can then turn into uh fuel and that fuel is essentially then sold to the main game how that actually works is pretty complex so i don't want to get too into it but there's basically a liquidity pool and you can sell your fuel straight in and then extract eth out of it and how that works is the the main game is always utilizing that fuel and so the the for, for things like uh, shard curing and uh, enhancements weapons all, all that uh, fusing and and all of those sort of things so essentially what that means is you do a whole bunch of interactions on your 
uh, plot of land. And, and the way that it works is it's, it's sort of like a, an idle clicker. So it's not massively interactive. It's kind of just, you have mined X blocks now, harvest it and, and make sure that you're efficient at, at doing that. Yep. But there are a, a, a couple of other really you know cool things that paths mm. that you can go down to, that, that you can go through. If you're not just about extracting resources, you can do things like uh, essentially get the, the the footprint of alluvials, which then allows you to, to be able to create emotes uh, in the main game. Essentially, you're, you're trying to get as many of these resources as possible, and then you're trying to sell them to the main game for a profit. And when you say sell to the main game, do you mean there's a, obviously you said there's a liquidity pool for the fuel. Um, so basically if I have land, I basically mine the fuel and then I sell it to the liquidity pool. So you, you're, you're in your land plot, you are mining. If, if you are going for fuel, yeah. then you get the, I think it's carbon. But again, I'd have, to, there's so many different names. Yeah, <laughs> I actually saw carbon. In. Yep. Yeah, I, th I think it's carbon, but you're essentially trying to, to get as much carbon as, as possible. You then utilize your, your factories to uh, refine that. And there's like vehicles where you need to extract it and, yep. and stuff like that. And then you get that carbon and you essentially sell that. We, the alluvium, uh, alluvium vault will initially seed that pool. And so yep. that will give the, the ability for people to, from the Alluvium Zero game, to sell fuel into this pool and then extract the ETH out. And the people in the main game are utilizing that fuel and yep. doing the opposite. They're paying ETH in order to extract fuel to do things like enhancements and and uh ah. weapons and cure the shards and whatever so sure it, it it creates this sort of really cool dynamic where if the landowners decide to pool all of their fuel and they don't want to sell it to the, they they want to make it really scarce over say i don't know a week period or whatever then the price of curing shards goes up a bunch because there's so much less fuel in the system yeah and then all of a sudden people are getting a very high premium for selling their fuel so then you'll have a flood of people selling the fuel which yeah. means the curing shards at that point will go down in price and so things will be cheaper in the main game and so you just get this really cool dynamic between the mini game and the main game and it essentially it's it's like uh it's, it's basically just gamifying real world uh, crypto stake. Yeah, it's like it's supply and demand money. there. So if people need the fuel, they'll get it. They'll pay premium, vice versa. There's going to be an inflection point where someone wants to sell at that price and, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's actually really, really cool. So if I own land, is it something that uh, it makes it makes these uh, materials and stuff offline while I can go do something else? Or do I have to be playing the game to collect them? Is there like a time frame of like wait one hour no, to you can it's collect? An idle, no, no, it's an idle clicker. So it's, it's, it's like click i have started harvesting come back in 30 oh. minutes i have the resources yep. go do another thing so it's 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 not meant it's it's essentially it is definitely a mini game you know yep. it's not meant to blow anyone away but <laughs> it's 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 designed to give you something to do while you're you know doing your other crypto investments and, sure. and stuff like that and it, essentially it was a gap filler for us to, to be able to give people something prior yeah. to Alluvium, the main game launching. So like Age of Empires, I sent, I mean, is there only one, you can only have one character doing the, the task at once. So it's like Age of Empires going to pick some wood and then it takes say 30 minutes and then you collect it. Is there only one character that can get the materials at once or is there multiple characters you send out? And I, I believe at this stage, it's only one, yeah. but I'm not 100% sure on that, actually. That's, okay. uh, that's a good question. That's something. Maybe I'll, I'll see if I can figure out by, before the end of this call. <laughs> sure. I'll send a message to Johnny. 
Sure. So basically to sum up land, it's you, you buy the land and there's seven different regions of land because there's seven, seven different uh, worlds or, or whatever the terminology is there. And obviously different worlds will or uh, planets will have different resources. Uh, some will get you more, some will get you less. You then uh, yep. set up a, a, a basically a land base, if you want to call it that. Uh, you'll have a character that you just sort of point and click. You'll collect your, your fuel or your oil or whatever the task is. Uh, and then you can also sell that to uh, the marketplace uh, to to get back ether or whatever it may be. Now there is tier zero, which is free to play there, and then there's tier one to five, which is obviously more the play to earn style. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So you guys can play this game as like a little demo on tier zero, guys. If someone was coming into this game and they wanted to do the play to earn, what would you say? I see a figure uh, sort of scouring the internet. If they wanted to do the play to earn model, uh, what would be like sort of the entry barrier uh, that would get you started with you know your shards and your character and whatnot? It hasn't been set, but I would say your your barrier to entry is. I, I would ideally like to see it at around. About twenty dollars, and so what that entails is essentially mining your your first shards. They'll if if you get a tier one shard, you then need to uh, pay the curing fee. I'd ideally like to see that around ten bucks. Yeah. Then to travel to a tier one region, same thing. Looking at um, around ten bucks. Something okay. Like that. Great. Is there a hundred thousand land in total, and that's ever there'll be, or is it like a twenty-five percent? You guys are giving a uh, selling on on the Dutch auction style. Um, so how does how is that working? So there's going to be a hundred thousand plots in total, yep. and we're selling in the first tranche uh, twenty thousand. Okay. This is one thing that we're discussing at the moment. I don't like that there's no roadmap for a lot of the games that that have sold land and it's a huge red flag. like i didn't even notice it myself like i bought pretty big in uh, in axie infinity's land <laughs> yep. um, very very early on and i didn't even know at that stage that there were another eighty thousand plots that could be sold and so yeah. i think it can't just be hey here's twenty thousand plots and there's no timeline of when we expect to distribute the other eighty thousand plots yep it's just too big of a risk for me like just personally if i'm just putting my investor hat on i'm like oh what if they flood the market or you know when do they plan this there's a whole bunch of things there so i think we need to come to the council with a proposal to say this is how the land is is being sold this is exactly you know where it's going which right now all the land sales are, are going to go into the vaults and then back out to to stakers that's a little bit of uh, alpha for the listeners if uh, <laughs> if you're staked in alluvium there's going to be a, a, a very very large uh, revenue distribution coming up uh, not financial advice at all <laughs> i was waiting for it i really was yeah, nice, <laughs> nice, nice. It's, yeah, so I think once we get that to the council, then we'll we'll shore everything up. But definitely, there's going to be twenty thousand plots that are available, and we're working on the web page that's going up now. It's a really really cool UI that you're you're going to be able to look at, where you can choose where you want your piece of land. You can choose to to purchase two that are next to each other that may or may not be. Uh, an advantage to doing that <laughs> something's telling yeah. me it might be again chat maybe <laughs> yeah and then yeah just just attaching that to a use case you know we've, we've got three hundred thousand people that have across all of our different socials and whatever that have subscribed or registered or followed or whatever and so you know with twenty thousand plots that are going to be sold initially only and that many eyeballs on on the project mm. i'm quite excited yeah now i did see uh star atlas which is another play to earn game launched very very recently their ships a bit of uh 
pros and cons from from what I'm hearing is they did release the ships, uh, but then people were unaware if there was more of them, if there was unlimited amount of them. So I think a clear roadmap, especially for investors or people that want to play the game, there's nothing worse than investing in something and then all of a sudden there's more of them. I uh, Just to put this in terms, I love the idea of mystics, axes, because you know that there's going to be no more. Um, yeah. So I, I love the idea of the roadmap of people knowing when the land's coming out. Um, as much as I love this Dutch auction style, I, I like. I think it's very, very smart because I know there's going to be a massive demand for the land uh, when they do launch. Is that how it's going down? And if people don't know, the Dutch auction works like basically it'll start at a high price and then it'll slowly go down in price until there's a buyer found. Um, is that how you guys are doing it or how, how yes. does that work? Yeah, it is. Yes. The Dutch it, it is, right? And, and it works very, very, very well with our balancer sale. We, and, and part of that, part of the reason was because we educated our community and said, this is genuinely going to start at an artificially inflated price. It is not where we think the, the, the market should be based on a game that's, you know, pre-launch, doesn't yep. have a demo out and, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, the vast majority, I would say at least 80%, took that on board and said, okay, like, let's act like these guys have never, you know, they, they're not doing anything um, to, to, you know, screw us over or anything like that. So yep. let's listen to them. And yeah, they, they ended up getting ILV around, you know, a, a, most people around 40 to $60 range. And so, and, and, you know, that at one point it went up to like $140. So we've seen this method work and, you know, we, we had pushback early on where people were saying, oh, well, you know, we've been ILV holders for so long. You know, we've been here since the beginning. We help out so much with Discord. And so, you know, we feel like the first 20,000 plots should go for like 20 bucks. Yep. <laughs> and I was like, look, I like, I, I love that. I, I also want <laughs> everything should be free. Everything should be free. I want to, and I want millions of dollars in my bank account. Thanks. That's the perfect exactly. word, right? <laughs> and look, normally when you've got your community of whatever product it is, like whatever business, I don't care what it is. Right? <laughs> if, if you've got a situation where you're the person that is getting, you know, a hundred percent of those revenues and your community is just, just enjoys the product, right. Or, or gets some use out of it, but is not getting what you're getting out of it. Then that's going to be a very awkward conversation where they're saying, Hey, we're the people who support you. So give it to us cheaper. And you kind of, kind of set, you get to this happy medium where it's like, okay, well, we're not going to try and absolutely destroy you and, and generate so much revenue that you know our customers can no longer live there's that happy medium of we need to build the business and blah 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 in our case i'm distributing it back to you so yeah. why am i why would we not try and maximize the most amount of money out of a land sale that we possibly can if I'm saying, but it's it's like, yeah, I know you want your $20, but you know the revenue distribution check that you're going to get because you're staked in the protocol. And they're like, oh, yeah, I am staked in the protocol. Yeah, you are. So if we go and generate a million dollars worth of revenue versus a hundred million dollars in revenue, do you want to get your portion of that hundred million dollars or do you want your thousand dollar plot for 20 bucks? Like, yeah. which one do you want? Right. And you know, when when you bring that argument to the table, it's it's all built into the system, right? If no no one owns the protocol, no one individual, and so every single person, doesn't matter who they are, should be trying to maximize the most um, amount of revenue that that you know from any of our exercises, any of our products, because every single thing feeds back into that ILV vault. And then gets distributed back out to the ILV stakers. Yeah, I love I your tokenomics are phenomenal. Like I've seen a lot. I'm I'm a big fan of Luna and Terra and stuff like that. And this just takes again uh, another level. Well, the way I think, especially with 100% going back to ILV holders. 
Um, and then just the, for the to sum up the land, and then I think I've only got about two questions left after that. Um, you're basically with the land. The zero uh, tier zero is free, uh, and then between one to five, I've heard things of like one tier one. Uh, lots of plans will probably go from 0.5 ETH to 1 ETH. And then I've heard stories of the tier uh, tier 5 going for, I believe, tens of millions because there's only seven of them. Um, is are these sort of rough, accurate numbers? Obviously, you don't know. You're just going to see how it all plays out. But is that sort of uh, the scaling so people can sort of get a gist of what the land will price will roughly be? I'll say loosely, yes. <laughs> loosely, <laughs> yes. Okay. All right, well, I've, I've, got, a, I've got about uh, 50 ETH. I'm going to sit on the sidelines so I can see what I can pick up uh, when the time is right. And uh, Kieran says, uh, free land for everyone. No, I'm kidding, chat. Just kidding. <laughs> I have a personal question here I always ask because I am invested in Terra slash Luna. If you, I don't know if you know the project. Um, I got in very, very early at like 20 cents, and uh, it's one of my passion projects. Um, stable coins is a big thing. Uh, will there ever be a stable coin on your project for UST, decentralized or centralized coins? Is it something you're looking at or you guys are sticking with the Ethereum uh, based currency? So again, there's a, there's a guy who uh, has a stable coin. His, uh, his name is Kane and it's uh, <laughs> Damn it. USD. Damn it. <laughs> yeah, fair call, fair call. If you guys but, don't know, Kane's his brother, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But um, no, the funny thing here is back in, the, <laughs> I can't even believe I'm saying this, but back back in Burger Collective days, back in like, oh, I don't know, 2018 or whatever, <laughs> I, I came to Kane and I said, hey, I've got this awesome app and, you know, we you've got thousands and thousands or hundreds of thousands of people that know your, your token and whatever, what do you reckon we we implement uh, SUSD and and give people the ability to, to buy burgers with your stable coin? <laughs> and he was like, "Get the hell away from me!" But I mean, now yeah. that I have a global <laughs> gaming enterprise, which is potentially going to have millions of players. I have a feeling that he's probably going to want SUSD integrated at some point. Yeah. I've also uh, invested in uh, Faye protocol, which is a decentralized stable coin. So maybe they'll be competing with the, with uh, with who gets gets in first. But no, to answer your question, yeah, we we are looking at that. But even prior to that, we're working very closely with IMX to get Fiat on ramp. Yep. Because we're like going AAA, we're not trying to stay within the crypto bubble. Yep. We're literally trying to go get the 3 billion market share of mainstream gamers out there. And so part of that is 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 obviously, yes, we're, we're going to need a stable coin, mm. but we'll definitely, definitely need a fiat on ramp at some point. Yeah, I like how you're looking on the outside instead of just in the crypto space. I see a lot of projects, I'd say 99% of them just look to capture the crypto people. When I think it's personally wrong myself, you need to look for the main, the masses, how to onboard them. Um, and I think uh, this game has uh, a very big chance of, of doing exactly that. And I can sort of foresee the future, especially a game from what I've seen of the teasers, it is looking absolutely phenomenal. So I'm super excited. Beta comes out, I believe. Is there going to be uh, people playing the game prior to it coming out? One, when am I playing it? Can I fly to Sydney? Where's my secret <laughs> access? <laughs> so on and so forth. I don't know if someone has put out like a, a note or something. See, like yeah. start talking to Kieran about like I, I, I've said from day one, I don't control the beta program. I don't have anything to do with it. I, so I can't, and the reason I'm doing that is because I have such a rubber arm. And if someone says to me, hey, I'll give you some marketing, <laughs> I end up just going like, fuck, yep, yeah, I'm yeah. in. <laughs> I'm the same. I'm literally the same. So, uh, yeah. So I, I will say what I say to everyone. I'll put you down. And um, what that means is, and I'm serious about this. What what that means is uh, you will get an invite to to join um, basically what is going to be like a, a little test that you'll have to go through if, if you do want to go through with that. 
and for those that uh, that pass the test, that and and that's basically just to ensure that we're going to get the the required feedback out of the the alpha and the the beta testing that that we need, and um, and yeah, so I'll I'll definitely put you down for that. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, and uh, hella excited um because we've literally i've had twitter for about six weeks and uh exploded very recently um so yeah i'm, I'm really excited uh but kieran look thank you so much for joining us i really appreciate it. it's opened my eyes up to more of this project do you have any secret alphas which I, I know you've already leaked a bunch and i see you're the one that leaks all the photos and everything and gets in a slight a little bit of trouble for aaron being more resilient um but is there anything you want to the closing thoughts or anything and then i'll shout out your socials as well Ooh. Yeah, it's uh, like, what can I say? What can I not say? <laughs> uh, Jesus. No, I'm not, I, I want to. I, I, I really, 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 really want to. But <laughs> I've gone on so many of these AMAs and I, I like, he's like, dude, you just got to You got to shut up. You just <laughs> got to shut up. You got to stop revealing all of my secrets. But, yeah. um, so I, I apologize. I usually would come with a leap, but... Um, I got to keep quiet today. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you for coming on. Uh, Nay, can you put no his socials in the chat? Remember, guys, this is Alluvium. This is a full breakdown. I'm going to cut all these clips up. It's going on YouTube, as you guys all know. Uh, thank you for coming on. I cannot wait to play this game. I've got my Ethereum ready for the land game. If I can be of any help to you, please don't hesitate to reach out. And uh, thank you for your time. I cleared a lot of answers up for us. Just uh, one, one last thing before I go. I think I've seen... <laughs> in your wow. chat that I've been called Ed Sheeran about <laughs> 17,000 times. Have you really? Just to clear it up, this is what you call strawberry blonde hair. <laughs> it's not full red hair. Nothing against gingers, but definitely not Ed Sheeran. <laughs> I did see someone call you hot earlier on in the stream and I didn't bring it up because we're halfway through the conversation. So you've got a few fans out there. <laughs> Well, I just got called Ed Kieran, so I guess I... Uh, <laughs> Perfect. All right, Kieran, my All man. Right. Thank you so much, brother. I appreciate Thanks, it. Man. See you guys. Bye. Bye.